What do you see out there? Asked the inhuman man. The officer was trembling, shaking. What had he done wrong? How had he not accomplished his duty? He wanted to ask. He wanted to ask so badly. But the Inquisitor had ordered him not to speak, and he couldn't disobey. No matter how he tried, he just could not. They stood at a window, the largest window of his critical relay center. From there, much of the battle between the Jedi forces and those at the primary bunker were clearly visible. Do you want to know what I see? He whispered. Javrik couldn't budge, couldn't even tremble. Below them, men were screaming and dying, being cut down in swaths. They were relying on this center, this station, to help them parse through the chaos of the spreading, planet-wide conflict. But he was helpless. I see a great peace on an even greater board said the Inquisitor. I know you do not understand, he continued. To you, the pieces are the men, the tanks, maybe even the bases. The Inquisitor swept his hand out as if unveiling an open secret. But to me, the scale is a bit bigger. And this whole planet, New Cadia, constitutes just one valuable piece. And, as I'm sure you know, when playing regicide, a piece's value is determined by how it can attack the enemy in its current placement, or what advantage might be bought through its sacrifice, he said. Swarms of the maddened, light-wielding wizards spun, running up buildings, leaping chasms, and butchering the guardsmen who tried to slow their advance. The lieutenant could see it all, was watching it all fall apart, slowly, inexorably. Sadly, Nucadia does not hold much offensive value, said the Inquisitor. Ah, but it's sacrifice. There lies the key to the game. Potentially, everyone remembers the breaking of the Cadian Gate for what it cost us. But I remember what it gave us as well. What if we could gain that again? That unity, that shared purpose. But pay only a fraction of the cost. Javrik felt his uniform sticking to him, despite how cold he was. So cold he wished he could shiver, could do anything other than watch the massacre happening below, or listen to the man beside him. He felt a wetness cool the edges of his eyes, but could not even blink. I would have to be a fool not to take it, not to use every piece to its fullest potential. Don't you agree? Hmm, I thought so. And since we both agree on what must be done, let me tell you now, before the close, what will be done. The crooked man whispered into his ear, the act nearly causing the officer to void his bowels on the spot. We will tease them out all that we can. We will make legends on this planet. Saints and martyrs for all involved. We will make sure every eye falls on this pitiful world. We will make an audience of the galaxy and show them the wonders of this war. Do you see? We shall let them fight, and shoot, and kill. We shall let the Republic have its moments, 
Allow them to believe they can win. And we shall make heroes of our fallen. <laughs> Legends of our stands. We shall let them struggle! The man cried, his voice nearing inhuman laughter as he continued. We shall let the replicate swarm and die! Let the angels fly and fall upon them! We shall watch men and beast and Xenos be broken and scattered like chaff before weapons of war unimagined by our foes. Do you hear me, Lieutenant? We shall let them make them struggle. And when finally all eyes of worth are here, and not can happen over this sickly sphere that is not seen. When this false war reaches its crescendo, my messenger shall blow upon the devil's horn. The Inquisitor seemed to settle with those last words, his smile still present and horrible to behold. Javik tried to budge, tried to say something, to ask why? Why was he being shown and told all of this? Why had they killed all the men in his relay post? And when that horn is sounded, hell shall follow. A reckoning to turn the stars red and earn us the Imperium we deserve. Ah. Glorious, and so close now. Oh, you are wondering why I didn't kill you like the others. Alas, stifle that guttering flame of hope. Your death is assured, and what's more, it shall be the hardest death among any suffered here. For my companion has... Appetites, I must sate. A regrettable, but entirely valuable sacrifice. I promise you, in this, you and New Cadia are very much the same. But I am not an unmerciful man. And so, before I send you to your fate, I give you this small elucidation in the hopes you might in your suffering appreciate some aspect of your purpose and service the words were surreal to the lieutenant all the way up until he felt taloned hands wrapping around his torso and waist he tried to scream harder than he ever had before and the effort made him gasp suddenly somewhat free, at least so much as his voice was concerned. You are insane! He gasped, trying to extend the control to his limbs and body, but finding the vice around those only tightening, preempting his efforts. Let me eat him, master. You had your words. Let me have my meal kissed the monster who held him from behind. This time, Javik did release his bowels, though the Inquisitor did not seem to notice. He looked almost genuinely sorry, or as close as one could get with such sharp teeth and strange, inhuman eyes. I thank you for your service, the man said. No, no! Javik gasped. But the Inquisitor looked past him now, and nodded his head once towards whatever it was that held him. Jevrick managed to scream once more, briefly, before he was enforced into silence again. But despite his quick silencing, Jevrick would suffer for a small eternity, as the demon he was given to took its time and fed.
Anakin shuddered, sweat weeping from his skin as he hung, blind and paralyzed. The Jedi felt like he had been locked inside a microwave, which had been set to its lowest power setting and was now left to slowly roast from the inside out. He tried to struggle but could hardly tell if he was bound or truly paralyzed, though he was certain that the blindfold which was sheathing his eyes was real. He wiggled and, after several sickening moments, concluded that he was bound. Bound and, as it turned out, hanging upside down, an unpleasant fact he discovered when he suddenly found himself heaving up what little remained of the breakfast he had eaten earlier. The sick spilled through slits in the gag they had forced into his mouth, choking him for a few seconds before it drained, falling into his nose and the upper half of his face. Anakin tried to swing, to whip himself clean by the motion, but was held far too tightly to do more than add a subtle sway to the encompassing imprisonment he had been placed into. And still, the roasting, sometimes hot, sometimes cold, went on. He could see nothing, hear nothing but his own gasps and groans, and taste nothing but his own bile. Even the Force was distant, if not gone entirely from his perceptions. This... this was torture, and it was only the beginning he knew. Anakin did not need to access the Force to know that his ordeal had just begun, or so he had thought, but to his unspeakable relief, he heard something, a hiss, the sliding of the door, and the whir of tracks that he knew from memory. His hope was made real when R2 beeped a greeting to his imprisoned form. The Jedi groaned in response, and a few moments later, felt the bindings loosening, gasping as he was released and dropped to the floor. Anakin tried to rise, but found he was still bound in sheets of thick rubbery cloth, a substance he was liberated from a few moments later when R2 rolled over to him and used his cutting torch to free his friend. Anakin rolled over and clawed at the gag and blindfold that had been locked around his face, tearing them away and coughing for several moments, ripping off a piece of his robe and wiping his face with it. Eyes clear of both blinding restraints and sticky sickness, he looked around at where he was. A small room, clearly some form of interrogation chamber, it even had a pair of chairs and a desk between them, with the interrogator's chair being of an obviously more comfortable nature. However, hanging behind the uncomfortable, stark metal chair that would normally be the place of the person to be interrogated, were two hanging, coffin-like pods. They were thick, hinged, and hanging upside down, Anakin's open and empty, the one beside it still closed, its inhabitant silent and inscrutable behind its restraints. Ugh, the Jedi groaned, holding his throbbing, fevered skull. R2 chirped sadly, and Anakin shook his head in response. No, it's not that. You have no idea how glad I am to see you. Seriously, I thought I was done for a second there. It's just... this place. It's wrong. It denies the Force, and frankly, it feels like it's denying me too. R2 beeped at that and straightened rolling over to the closed door and extending his access probe towards a similar control slot. Hold on, R2. Before we go, there is something I think we should do, he said. The black walls were coated in scrolls of yellowing paper, adhered to the stone, or stone-like material, by stamps of what looked like red wax. They seemed to silently shift and waver in a wind that couldn't be felt and that wind was subtly drawing itself in towards the other prisoner. Anakin approached the hanging metal sarcophagus and knelt to look into its face. It had a pallid, vaguely feminine mask with empty eyes and grills over the mouth. The Jedi could still hear the soft rasp of breath coming from within, though he could see no eyes as he knelt, looking into the dark confines of the mask and was certain that the prisoner had been blindfolded as well. Can you hear me in there? asked Anakin, voice hesitant. No response. The cadence of the breathing did not even change. Fair enough, Anakin thought. This person had been here for who knows how long and could only reasonably expect an interrogator to be speaking. 
If this prisoner did know something else of worth, he or she would be loath to let it go or make it easier to retrieve by engaging with their torturers. But Anakin wanted to know this person, wanted to know what manner of enemy the Imperials had already made before confronting the Republic. He was tempted to try to use the Force to scan for surface thoughts, but even without that monster from before being present, his connection to the Force was pained and tenuous. And he knew that something in this place, in this very cell, was jamming or blocking his connection to the Force. Open this one up too. R2-D2 returned the order with a low, hesitant warble. I know, but whoever this is, it's someone they desperately want dead, almost as much as they want whatever they know. I can't turn back after having come this far, so let's not waste any more time. Pop it open, he said. R2 paused, beeping an affirmative and drawing his friend's attention before launching the Jedi's lightsaber out towards him from a small hatch on his dome. Anakin snatched the saber out of the air, only fumbling it a little before activating it with a fierce smile, nodding in gratitude to the droid before turning to fully regard the other prisoner. The astromech rolled over to an input slot in the wall and inserted the access probe, twisting it for a couple of seconds until the first lock clamping the sarcophagus shut hissed loudly and cracked open. Sector clear! said the clone commander, his men spreading out from his position and stepping over the corpses of the droidmen and Imperial soldiers. The chamber was dark and cavernous to a ridiculous extent. Icons of the Imperial's perverse droid worship hung from every corner, and the bays were filled with various massive vehicles, most of which, thankfully, appeared incomplete or in the midst of maintenance. The speeder bikes chirped past, their spotlights cutting lines out of the darkness as they swam through the air in alternating bursts of high speed movement and lazy hovering. Between the bikes and hunting clones carried aloft on jetpacks hovered the specialized ISP speeders. Like larger, thicker predators, the ISPs floated, capable of movement nearly as rapid as that of the speeder bikes, despite the fact that they mostly merely rotated slowly, holding key positions in the room as the others moved through it. This had been one of the most entrenched areas of defense, so much so that Commander Bly himself had been forced to respond to it. The vast majority of the Imperials had fallen back towards the Basilica and its intact defensive ring, but not these men. For one reason or another, they had tried to fight with the superior, mobile forces of the clones, refusing to even retreat from the massive room, which allowed Bly's vehicle support to outflank them handedly and thereby cut them down. Losses were sustained, and he wouldn't deny that. But, by and large, the operation was a complete success. Already, the generators they had found were being rigged to explode, and these vehicle bays were next. Yet, as he looked upon the mountainous shape of an 11-barrel tank that would put even a juggernaut to shame, he began to reconsider. Such weapons. Perhaps this was the reason the imps had tried so hard to hold this room. His considerations were interrupted by a ping in his calm. Standing on the ground and allowing his jetpack to cool, the clone reached up to his helmet and accepted the communication, and the contents shocked him. One of his squads had discovered and captured a droidman, and what's more, the Imperial claimed to be the leader of the red-robed cyborgs themselves. Without any delay, Bly ascertained their position and kicked off of the ground. The bay became a blur around him as Bly arched up into the air, smoothly locking onto the location he sought and redirecting himself in that direction with a few twitches of his controls. ISPs and speeder bikes zipped around him to move ahead and circle the spot. Already, he could see that many of his men had surrounded the zone, guns up and aligned carefully towards what he assumed to be the place where the prisoner had been cornered. He landed neatly near the center of the action, making a quick scan of the situation. He had so many questions, and even beyond that, having access to their leader would likely allow him to force surrender out of the holdouts they were sure to encounter later on. 
The clones who had found her were not far and came to report when Bly descended onto the scene. Two ISPs hovered overhead, spotlights pointed on the hunched figure in red. The clones, ten of them, surrounded her, carefully aligned to avoid crossfire. He saw that none had approached beyond a certain point and landed closer than they stood. He straightened and strode towards the curled, vaguely feminine figure. Her hands were splayed out and empty, but even that gesture was spoiled by the fact that those hands seemed utterly bladed from fingertips to palms. Bly had seen something like those hands before. He had recalled the Trandoshan statue made entirely out of Wookiee Reich blades. Its reptilian hands extended as if the figure was about to pounce. It had made him uneasy to look upon that inanimate thing then, and it made him feel no better to be reminded so precisely of it now. He halted well out of arm's reach and aimed his blaster towards her, aligning it a little to the left. I have questions, he said sternly. The figure lifted its hooded head. The priest of these droid men was a hunched, curled thing, with a large misshapen mass upon her back which bulged in her robes and rose above her head. She was bent beneath it, and yet, despite this, her face was not grotesque as many of these things had been. In place of an unnatural melding of flesh and metal was a silvered mask reflecting in preternatural detail the features of a young, beautiful human woman. Her eyes, a dark orange, peered from the metal lids of the subtly smiling face, its expression frozen in the casting of its creation. I know, she said to him in a startlingly human voice. But you are not a full knight! Kallax said to her. Nerva furrowed her brow. No, but as I've already told you, that doesn't matter. I can do this. I just need to get down there, she insisted. The sergeant's frown only deepened. His squad stood around him, all of them now conscious and present, looking about furtively as they waited for a decision to be made. She had thought the hard part had been over once Bovin had brought her these guardsmen, but it seemed they would not be easily coaxed deeper into the maintenance bays. I've served with Imperial Knights before, the sergeant said flatly. But not Knights of the Mechanicus. My master, rest his steel, gave his life to get us this far. He did so because he knew I was ready, and I am. All I need is passage into the cockpit, and I'll be able to turn this whole battle around in minutes, Nerva insisted, wincing as she moved her slung arm and rekindled some of the pain there. The sergeant shook his head, his scrunched face looking decidedly unconvinced. There isn't any way in the Omnissiah's deepest hell that you are ready to pilot one of those walkers unless you've ticked all your boxes! You want me to rely on an impossibility for our safety, and I just can't do that! We're not Skitari, our priority is to regroup with the rest of our forces, he said. Damn you! Sergeant, listen! My Master's Knight is not the only thing down there! The Magos Dominus herself is waiting for me! Those bays have Bane Blades, Honor Dragoon Crawlers, Basilisk Artillery Batteries, and their assorted ammunitions! Nerva shrilled. Those machines cannot, must not, fall into the enemy's hands! The resultant damage from that kind of technological appropriation, especially this early in the war, could be lethal for us both! All of us! The Mechanicus and the Imperium! But even in the face of her impassioned words, Sergeant Kallak Norn looked less than convinced. She understood that. She didn't want to die in this place either, but the threat to the technology of the Mechanicus could not be overlooked for something as petty as personal survival. She grit her teeth, watching as the sergeant conversed with some of his soldiers. The seconds were dripping by, and it was only a matter of moments before the replique regrouped and moved to take back the chamber. Uri coursed through her like a current, and she did not neutralize it, for she knew that not all emotions were meaningless and most vital to survival among all of them was the ability to feel fear and take it seriously. That very serious fear very nearly made her do something rash, but she was forestalled from any reckless course of action by Kallak's words spoken only a moment later. Alright, fine, what's your plan? He said. Nerva floundered for a moment before clearing her throat. 
It's simple. We go to those super heavy turbo lifts, get down into the greater vehicle bays, and get me to the night. Once inside, I'll pilot it over to the lift so you can raise me up to surface level. Then, all of you mount up somewhere and hold on, since I'll be making my own exit and then rejoining the fold, she said. And the other tech you mentioned? What about it? Asked the sergeant. Nerva bit her lip. I suppose I'll have to fire the last impulsor down into the Prometheum reserves. The resulting blasts may not destroy all of our war machines, but it should bury them in flame enough to keep the enemy away until we can properly take back these shrines, she said. The sergeant considered it for only a couple of seconds longer before nodding stiffly. Right, let's go then, he said, waving to his guardsmen. Nerva sighed in relief as she turned and led them at a run to the massive lifts. The greater vehicle bays were three levels down, and had it been Nerva's decision, they would have ridden one of the four massive lifts all the way to their destination. She was eventually grateful, though initially irritated, when Sergeant Norn took her arm to forestall her. Hey, what are you- she started to say. Gala, snap an eye down there for me, he said. The single woman and their team, Gala, sprinted forward to the ledge of the lifts, going to one of the vacant shafts and unslinging a long lass. Nerva knew the pattern at a glance, and knew the power of the scope it came equipped with. So she did not doubt the woman's words when she reported that the enemy was present on the lowest level. Bofin, Nerva said, speaking through her mouth and the new sphere both. The hovering skull zipped forward in response and came before her. Tie into my optic receiver. Uh, good. Now, go down there and scout and stay out of sight, she said to it. The skull chirped an affirmative and hovered out over the yawning pit that led down, descending silently and rapidly. While it did, Nerva fished through her robes and withdrew a data pad from one of her many pockets. The flat black rectangle of glossy material was only a little larger than her hand, but it would serve her purpose. She carefully drew a cord out from her elbow and plugged it into a small circular socket on the side of the pad. After that, it took her less than a second to connect and begin streaming Bofin's visual field into it. The soldiers crowded around to see, and they all watched as Bofin drifted into the massive room and began to look around. Frag this! said the biggest man, Janus. By the fire of the throne, how are we even... stuttered another, a soldier who had been unconscious until recently. Nerva felt her organic muscles clench. She wanted to resent their reactions, but even she had trouble doing that, seeing the same thing they were. The bays were covered in replicae, most scouting about and securing the location on foot, while others flew and swept through the air on jetpack units. To add to that already insurmountable force, slim Republic jet bikes zipped and flew through the air like Harkosan storm snipes. And between them, the hovering, menacing forms of larger gun platforms were visible. All in all, it seemed like many times more than they could handle. And before Nerva could even begin calculating approaches to this now suicidal mission, the situation seemed to grow only darker than before. Oh no, she whispered in spite of herself. Horus is hairy sack! Is that who I think it is? Karak Norn groaned from over her shoulder. Nerva nodded numbly. Standing there, surrounded by the enemy, was the Magos Dominus herself. The tech aspirant felt a pit forming in her stomach, and she couldn't help but flounder at the sight of this latest despair-ridden revelation. Is there any way to communicate with her? Asked the youngest member of the group, the driver of the now-abandoned Chimera. No, I... Wait, yes! Nerva said, jumping at the sudden thought. I can attempt a new sphere connection using Bofin as a free-moving relay, she said, already beginning the process to accomplish just that. Moments later, she took a deep breath as the icy embrace of the new sphere data currents fully enveloped her, diving in and beginning to swim. The standard new sphere relays were all working with either sustained damage or lacking power, barely allowing the functionality for any circulation of data at all. But with Bofin now acting as a relay, the currents were pushed into a more regular stream. She followed the flow it produced, and with a mind made of liquid crystal information, she reached out, 
sliding through and past dead ends and fragmenting transfer codes until she reached the outstretched mind of the Dominus herself. Ah, there you are, said the senior tech priest. I've been waiting. The Magus Dominus Kali Delta was amused by the first question the replicate chose to ask her. Here she was, the presumed commander of this clone's enemy, evidently at his mercy and willing to answer his questions, and the first thing he chose to ask was devoid of nearly all perceivable use. The veracity of the aforementioned presumptions and the naivety required to take them seriously alone struck the venerable priest as adorable. Such a lapse was clearly the product of a mind which had been given only 14 or so Terran cycles to mature and learn the world. But the question he chose was almost provocative in its lack of utility and indeed its chosen subject matter. But she did not question it, and, in fact, she prayed to the machine god that he would ask yet more useless queries as she performed her role and distracted him. Are you a droid or a human? The cloned soldier before her asked, the nozzle of his ionized particle blaster centered on her slouching form. She took a moment as if considering the question, though the answer was obvious. My mind is human, she said through her vocalizers, feigning cumbersome speech, drawing in their attention as they pieced together her words and sentences. But my body is improved, artificial. Why the scrog have you done this to yourselves? Why are you here? What is the objective of this occupation? The replicate snapped out. Talk, imp scum! She raised her hands a little higher, affecting a tremble through her limbs. With her precise control, it was easy no matter how unthreatened she actually felt. In spite of his commands, she took her time answering, beginning with his first question. I am an anointed chosen of the Omnissiah, he who perfects through intention, circuit, and steel, we replace our weakness with strength. This is our way, she said. Fine, enough. Why are you here, droidman? What do you want? The replicate pressed. I am here studying the Republic and its defenses, its threat level, she said, recovering technology, running projections, she added. Kali Delta was, of course, doing far, far more than that, but at least this was no lie. She had done all that she had mentioned. It was the predominant reason she felt so at ease, even then. Is that so? What did you find out? And keep it short, imp, or I'll stun you and send you back to base hanging from a speeder. The cloned thing threatened. Key findings are incomplete. The Republic's fighting forces are built on solid foundations, however, while threat vector one eye through four eye seem to be substantially met. This cannot be said for threat vectors I five through I eight, she said. What by the many moons is any of that supposed to mean? The replicate demanded. Said simply, the Republic's clone forces can match most 
standard elements of our own with enough variables to potentially succeed. She clarified. Well, that's obvious, I'd say, said the Republic clone. However, the Magos continued, your special forces are entirely unprepared to counter our own and your elite deployments are limited or do not exist. Beyond Jedi, none of your known infantry forces rank above I-4 as a threat vector. Sure, and what do you... He began to ask. Before he could finish, the clone stiffened, a voice reaching him through his helmet calm. Moments before the sound of weapons fire sprang out from a different section of the bays. He waved his hand and a few of the soldiers and speeders began to scatter. Already the Magos knew that the others had been spotted by one of the unattended patrols and prepared to escalate her diversionary tactics. Her robes billowed out and the sudden movement drew blaster fire from the men around her. The shots collided with her refraction field, a powerful pierce of Archeo technology and one which she maintained in prime condition. It swallowed their blaster bolts, transforming their mass and energy into bright white lights as servo skulls spilled out of the sleeves of her robes like masses of writhing flying insects. The hump which had bent and burdened the tech priest's form shrank and diminished, revealing its true nature as the swarm spun around them, most of the skulls unharmed thanks to the defensive field. Slowly, Kali rose from her previously hunched posture. The clones who had been shooting now pausing to shield their eyes from the bright flashes of light their weapons had caused. The first to reorient and react was the commander, though again she took her time, reaching up with bladed hands and gently seizing the hem of her robe, sliding it over her thin shoulders. Her task was distraction and she knew just how to distract soldiers. The clone watched, eyes wide inside his helmet as the garment pooled onto the ground around the priest's feet, revealing her bare body beneath. She would have smiled had her face not been a mask, perhaps even blushed despite her age. Live, angular, and perfectly efficient, her entire true body was built of magnetically interlocked blades and gears each and every single one lovingly sharpened and polished into monomolecular perfection. Every last literal inch of her was a dedication to the machine god's wrath, and every last solitary centimeter of her body could inflict that wrath, onto pain or onto pain of death. You had begun to ask something, Commander Bly. She said, now speaking smoothly, discarding the slow effect. Kali had learned his name from hacking into their comnet, a net she had been keenly listening to during their assault on her facility, her temple. She stepped out from the robes which had bound her, ocular systems linking with the floating skulls which flew about, girding her memcore for overclocking protocols as her internal secondary and tertiary cogitators awoke with a hum. I believe you meant to ask, what do you rank yourself at? Allow me to answer with context, she said. The clones began to fire, but again her refraction field drank it in easily. You are a veteran commander of the 327th Galactic Star Corps. At your projected best, you may rank I-5 as a threat vector. I am a Magos Dominus of planet Volcris, beholden to the priesthood of Mars. At the current moment, I am empirically ranked Threat Vector I-7. He had begun to back away, reaching somewhat behind his back for something mounted onto his belt, but it was already too late to stop her. 
The spinning, zooming servitors which flew around her finished linking into her systems. And the cogitators within her completed their combat boot sequences. Her senses were filled with the sensor feeds of dozens of drone skulls. And with the aid of her additional gogitators, the incoming data was parsed, sorted, absorbed, and then applied. Kali had used her predictive algorithms to rip Drukari witches asunder, and had long ago learned that all she required to become death itself was a sufficient number of eyes to see with. Her refraction field finally died smoking as it entered its recharging cycle, but its purpose was served. Almost without conscious effort, Kali began to dodge, swivel, and swerve around the incoming weapons fire, and never once did she stop advancing. The artillery had stopped. It had just stopped. First, bit by bit, and then, all at once. Sando's ears throbbed in the growing silence, the last volleys of precise death echoing still through and between the Axumite towers. He jumped and almost fell out of step as his brother spoke beside him, his voice loud in both the air and his earpiece, the comms having been required to talk and be heard at all only moments ago. I guess the artillery crews found something better to shoot at, said Biskin, voice trembling. Sando nodded, but neither of them believed it. After all, they'd still hear the artillery firing at someone else, if they were firing at all. And they were not. For the moment, he and his platoon were marching in their column, the main body of the army shielded and allowed to progress at rapid pace by the vanguard forces the general had sent out ahead of their advance and, of course, by the steady curtain of artillery fire. For minutes now, they had been watching the medivacs move back and forth from their line to the unseen fronts, delivering wounded and dead alike in numbers that chilled the clone. They had not started this close to the front, but slowly, more and more of the mainline platoons had been redeployed as vanguard support, presumably as a response to severe losses. Sando looked around, visors sweeping the front and sides of the vast roadway they were using to progress. Vast was actually the wrong word for it, he would think as he took it in again. Expansive, gigantic, or even excessive would have been more accurate attributions. The road shrank and swelled at odd intervals, as it was both joined by other, smaller avenues for one stretch and then divided back down in the next. At the current moment, it was easily large enough to accommodate two Venator-class Star Destroyers landing side by side, and still have a bit of room to spare. Initially, the road had been bare and clear, with only a surprisingly light spattering of civilian vehicles and wrecks, and almost no residual damage from the invasion prior. Now, however, they were marching over ground that the vanguard and artillery had fought and cleared ahead of them. The once straight streams of marching men found their lines distorted as clones picked their ways around piles of corpses, burning tanks, smoldering craters, and hastily assembled barricades and broken hardpoints. The smell of death and the breath of countless weapons was already tainting the air with its familiar musk, and Sando shuddered. He had thought it would be impossible for the terrain of Azure City to spark memories of the Shadow World campaign. The ARC-trained trooper felt the eerie silence around them thicken and become familiar, only disturbed by the sounds of their own walkers and footfalls, and the occasional distant echoes of battle. The clouds rolled in around them and hid the sun, shrouding their path in obscuring sheets of cold rain. It was a different darkness, a different foe, but it was the same war. He gripped his blaster more tightly, body gloves squeaking slightly under the plates of his battle armor. He was bred for war, bred from war, a sliver, a shard of the galaxy's greatest fighter, hammered into the shape of a soldier. Yet he still always 
always felt this. The dread. The yawning mouth of death taunting him, his every step forward a promise that his short life was growing shorter and shorter. He wondered if those sensations, those feelings of fear, were meant to sharpen him, to make him stronger, make him better at surviving, or at preventing the enemy's survival. Sando couldn't know, but he hoped it was the case, particularly when the captain began to issue new orders, orders the clone had heard issued many times before, two platoons further up the line of the column. They were being redeployed, being sent to the vanguard, Dark rumbles of thunder framed the orders as they were given, like ominous portents, and once more Sando could hear Death's grinning, hungry mouth taunt him. This time, Sando, I'll have you this time. It chuckled in his mind. He gave it no response, instead saluting with his brothers and following his orders. They picked up their pace, marching ahead of the column for a few minutes before a couple of modified ISP speeders pulling hover sleds arrived. He and his squad boarded one, cramming themselves in and taking their seats on the uncomfortable thin planks of metal that served the purpose, strapping in. The clones slid their long rifles between their legs, holding them there, barrels in their hands and aimed up as the ISPs tore off at a brisk pace jerking them all and making Sando fear that the sleds would topple, as he did every time. And as every time before, the repulsor lifts mounted to the sleds compensated for the pitch, aligning them behind the speeders as a city blurred around them, rain smacking their helmets. They were briefed over their comms, the voice of a sergeant loud and clear as he relayed what had been told to him over to the rest of the squads. Their mission was simple, they were joining the rest of their platoon in a flanking assault on an enemy hardpoint. Some of the imps had assembled a competently placed gun nest and were holding well past the point they should have been overtaken. Despite their relatively low numbers, casualties from the vanguard forces which had attempted to storm the position had been disproportionately high and the Imperials showed no mercy to the fractured remains of their blunted assaults. Sando and the rest were going to take a building that the Imperials had placed their backs to, and split into two teams. Team 1 would set charges behind the imps, while Team 2 took the roof and rappelled down on top of the enemy positions, firing all the while. It was imperative that they crushed this resistance on this attempt, as anything else would either stall the advance or force the main columns to become engaged as they came into contact with the hard point. Sando hoped this was the reason a whole platoon was being sent in, and not just a few squads, or better yet, some commandos. Whatever the reason, they were disembarking near the rear of the targeted building all too soon. The troopers stood and armed, preparing, squads separating to different entry points, priming breaching charges, checking windows, and synchronizing mission timers. Sando found himself pressed against the white steel of the wall beside a window. The glass had been scanned, brittle, so he knew he'd get through it without any trouble. The countdown was snapped out into his ear and, swallowing once, he watched as his brothers smashed the window clear before he propelled himself into motion. His armor protected him from the glass shards as he tossed himself over the lip of the breach and into the shadowed confines of the building. The sound of breaching charges rung out as he crossed, lights of dim stormy gray lancing into the dark structure before rifle-mounted lights activated. He and his platoon stormed in, covering each other as they advanced at rapid pace. He came to the rectangular entrance into one hallway and checked, crisp lamplight illuminating the space ahead of his brothers as they passed him and continued in. And for the briefest moment, just a moment, Sando dared to hope that the Imperials had left the building vacant, that they had left their backs exposed. Then came the explosions. Sando was tossed back out of the hallway on a concussive wave, no more than a piece of errant phlegm coughed out of a dragon's throat. His mind was sent scattering, and while he never truly lost consciousness, he lay stunned, motionless as chaos erupted around him. The imps had not relied on their minds alone to take care of all the clones, and drove into the stunned or destroyed point men of the Republic forces. 
Bright bursts of red and yellow light flashing down hallways and corralling the more numerous enemy squads away from their planned trajectories. Voices were shouting, clones and Imperials. Weapons fire heated the air and filled it with the sour fumes of spent munitions and scorched air. Distantly, he knew that they had been ambushed, that the Imperial hardpoint had been a trap, but those thoughts were difficult to grasp and keep a recurring epiphany of the worst kind. After some time, how much Sando had no way to tell, he sat up slowly and looked around. The explosions had thrown him out of the hallway and into a room somewhere. The complex they were fighting in seemed to be some kind of office building, and he had collided with a desk, collapsing it and half burying himself in white paper. His body ached from hair to toenails, and he felt sick, but at the sound of the alien imperial tongue, all those sensations began to bleach away. His translator was busted, so he had no way of knowing what the imps were saying as they drew nearer and nearer to the room. But he silently extricated himself from where he had landed, and, ignoring the pained protest of his limbs, crouched by the open door, watching and listening in. Finding his visor cracked and thereby obscured, he removed his helmet and placed it down next to him as he waited and watched. The fighting was still going on, but it was farther away now, and this area had certainly fallen behind the enemy's line. Two Imperials were strolling down the hallway, speaking to each other and casually executing any clones they found still breathing as they did. Sando felt rage build in his chest, but looking around, failed to spot where his rifle was resting. The two imps came to stand near his door, pausing just beyond. A trooper, half buried in the rubble from the wall beside him, groaned as they stepped onto the detritus which hid him. With a gesture and a chuckle, one of the soldiers kicked away some of the collapsed and shattered panels, exposing the Republic trooper's cracked helmet. Help! The clone groaned. The Imperials looked at each other and shrugged, one leveling his laser rifle down towards the clone. But it was the man behind him who cried out, the Imperial gasping out a scream of alarm before his breath was driven out of him by Sando's tackle. The clone pinned the man to the wall, grabbing him roughly by his thick shoulder plate and pulling. It was in this way that he was able to spin the man around in time to catch the other Imperial's volley of energy blasts, which had been fired not down at the injured clone, but instead back towards Sando himself. The soldier cried out in despair as he inadvertently shot his comrade, not killing the man, but further stunning the breathless Imperial Sando held locked in his arms. The clone wasted no time, reacting on instinct more than training, using his left hand to find the wounded man's holstered sidearm, yanking it free and pulling the trigger. Sando almost cried out for joy as he found the weapon without its safety engaged, spears of red light punching into the other soldier's chest and face. The dying man fired with a spray of his own red light, but falling to one knee, Sando managed to catch all the shots that would have struck him on his human shield. He smirked for just a moment as the man before him dropped to the ground, trigger still squeezed and discharging lasers into the wall beside him for several seconds. But soon, the clone hissed instead and tossed off his imperial human shield. The man had done nothing to him. He was quite thoroughly dead after the last volley. His body, riddled with so many shots, had become so hot that Sando had started to feel his neck and shoulder heating painfully. He took only a moment then to pull his fallen brother out from the rubble and lay him within the room among the papers. But Sando could hear more of the imps coming. He grit his teeth, swirls of dread and rage and raw hatred flitting through him. And then the insanity took him. The insanity that always took him when he managed to get his blood up and pumping. He hated that it had to come from this, but once it came at all, he couldn't help the emotions he felt. Some of his brothers inherited their gene father's natural talent with machines. Others, his penchant for creative thinking and command. And others still harbored Django's keen eyes or his thirst for victory at any cost. 
But Sando, in these moments, felt that he had inherited much more than any of his brothers had. Django had been the most lethal bounty hunter in the history of the galaxy. And Sando had inherited his father's killer instincts. Those impulses, desires, and emotions which compelled one being to simply understand how to end a life, and by what means to do it. He struggled to explain it to his brothers, and they struggled to understand quite what it was about him that made him the way he was. But Sando had no difficulty in displaying it, not once he was in the zone, so to speak. And here, behind enemy lines, alone, without his weapon, and injured, he was most certainly feeling as though he had found his zone once more. The clone looked around, eyes razor sharp. He spotted his fallen brother's blaster rifle, intact, and ignored it bending down beside the two Imperial corpses and yanking gear from their limp bodies. Grenades, a rifle, two pistols, and a long, wickedly curved knife came away with his red-tinged hands, and he wasted no time in strapping them around his body. Gear in place, rifle in hand, Sando paused to listen, feeling the hard thrum of lethal intention pulling on every fiber of his finite being. It took him a second or three, but soon he had a sense of where the Imperials were, and moved off in that direction. He crept, staying low, legs burning as he maintained a steady stride, weapon up and ready. He saw that there was a flashlight attached to the end of his gun, but didn't activate it. His eyes had become accustomed to the darkness by now. And for that, he was able to see the flashes of muzzle fire clearly in the doorway of his destination, as well as hear the sounds of combat. He came closer and closer, and within his mind an ocean of thoughts swirled, clawing at the purity of his purpose. Run! His animal instincts screamed into him. But it was not to those instincts that Sando was listening. Within every Mandalorian lived a beast, a fiend, a demon of war. It was a ghastly thing, a killing thing, and it was to this thing that Sando now lent all his attention. And as he crossed the final few feet to the entryway that led to the battle, it screamed its first comprehensible order into his ear, its ringing command driving out all other thoughts of any other kind. RUN! And he obeyed, picking up speed and almost throwing himself through the doorway. Awaiting him on the other side was a two-story lobby, open and tiered. The Imperials were engaging a retreating clone force here, having taken most of the room already. Emerging from behind them, Sando squeezed down on his desire to roar with all his might, the killer in him tamping down on the natural reaction. Instead of yelling a war cry, he dashed behind the first cluster of Imperials and opened fire. The weapon in his arms kicked oddly, the recoil soft, like an exhaling breath, nothing close to what he got from a DC-16. And that helped him drill holes into the backs of their heads as he sighted it down. It didn't fire like a blaster either, issuing a spray of red and orange bolts, like an indication laser being set to strobe. The way they seemed to bounce off the back of the Imperial's helmets, at least for the first few shots, made the weapon feel strangely weak in his hands. Yet when he corrected his aim for the last of the three, sighting his exposed neck, the clone was shocked to find the Imperial handedly decapitated in less time than it took for him to realize what had happened. It wasn't weak, he realized. It wasn't any kind of firearm at all. It was a death laser gun like a strobing flashlight of pure murder made into the shape of a rifle. He knew not why, but the realization tore a grin into his face, though neither did he pause to consider it, moving quickly to the next two Imperials. Perhaps because of his speed, or the fact that the gun he was firing was their own, the Imperials had yet to realize the wolf in their midst, and he caught the next two unprepared. He scythed off the head of the first just as the second turned around, sliding at the weapon's cartridge as he did and starting to reload even as his eyes met Sando's. Hostilit! He started to scream before Sando filled his jaws with atomizing light. 
But dead as the man was, his call had succeeded, and the dozen or so Imperials in the room swung to regard the commotion. He was moving even before then, all too aware of how easy a target he was in white armor and using the smooth steel pillars on the Imperial side of the room to hide. From the spatters of returning fire, those that spotted him sent his way. Sando kept his head down, running in a crouch and raising his gun, firing it over his head and providing his own covering fire for the second or two he needed to close the distance of the next pair of soldiers. He passed the last pillar and came into naked view of the two, one of whom was still firing at Sando's brothers on the opposite side of the room, while the other had his gun leveled at the approaching clone. The trooper felt his teeth almost crack, pushing his legs so hard he was sure his limbs would burst, all the while knowing that if they didn't, it still would not be enough. The Imperial opened fire, and Sando reflexively tossed the rifle in his arms at the enemy. Everything seemed to slow, time grinding down to a halt. He saw the rifle spinning in the air, saw the bolts of light, lightning quick even now, streaking towards him. But as the first bolts hit the rifle, they did not budge it, they only burned it. It wasn't until the scorched air collapsed around the impact shots that any actual physical force was applied to the gun in the air. And in those fragments of seconds, it ate too many of the soldier's shots. And Sando found himself shielded in the shadow of the gun he'd thrown, even as he drew the two pistols from his waist. The weapon burst in the air, and Sando smelled the unpleasant waft of burning plastic and scorched meat as the two red lances caught him, one on his left shoulder and the other on his left leg. The armor there blackened, lightened, but held as he leapt. Sando drove for the man's knees, colliding with his shins instead, and causing the Imperial to collapse, pitched forward over the clone as Sando raised his weapon. From the ground, he opened fire, spraying the other occupied soldier with twin barrels of red death. The man dropped, but not before the first soldier on top of Sando spun himself around, kicking the clone hard in the head and sending his aim wide. Likely, in this instant, range and rate of fire made up for his split vision. Pain brought him back to focus, the soldier having twisted onto his back while still on top of Sando, firing shots from his laser gun down at the clone's exposed head. A bolt of heat scoured the right side of Sando's face, and he ducked his head, avoiding the direct hits which would have more than burned him. He almost hesitated, but in the midst of pain and fear, training took over. He dropped his pistols and half spun, half reached around as quickly as he could, grasping the man's legs and then twisting them both, flipping over hard so that he was on top and the Imperial beneath him and now face down, unable to shoot for a few precious moments. Sando rolled up towards the man's back, pinning him to the cold ground with one arm while his other hand reached for the dagger he had taken earlier. The Imperial beneath him did not pause or cease resistance, however, curling his legs under him and rising in a rush, both slamming the back of his hard helmet into the clone's face and pitching him off. The Imperial soldier scrambled forward as Sando fell back, gasping as he pulled his knife free of the belt holster he'd taken, raising it up. But the man was already too far from him, collapsing against the pillar and using it for support as he spun around. Back sliding up as he stood, gun barrel rising towards Sando's chest. On his knees and barely able to see through his distorted vision, the clone threw his dagger, aiming for the man's face. The honed blade hummed through the air, its monomolecular edge slicing past atoms before burying itself a half inch into the hard, torso encompassing armor over the Imperial's chest. Not enough. Not nearly close enough. Sando let his arms drop limp, barely able to see the soldier smirk past his own blurred but clearing sight. Kadeus Asipit! The man growled. And then his head burst, a bright blue blaster bolt taking him from the left side. He dropped like a sack of drowned porgs, and Sando, who could barely register his continued existence, found himself gasping and alive. He looked around, eyes focusing, and began to understand. 
As he had made his assault, so too had the battle around them been persisting and progressing. Though the Imperials had been blindsided by Sando's rampage, the clones fighting them had noticed him from the start. Emboldened by his assault and aided by the quick felling of five of the enemy's soldiers, several of the other Republic troopers had taken the initiative, charging in through the gap and beginning a building flanking maneuver. A clone ran to where Sando knelt, offering him a hand, which the trooper took with a wince. He could feel the burns on his face beginning to assert their reality, and was relieved when the man handed him a back to pack. Kote, brother! said the clone, and though he wore a helmet still, Sando could tell that the trooper was smiling beneath it. Voden, Sando said in response, taking one of the fallen Imperial's rifles and setting his jaw. The clone took only a few moments rest to apply his Bacta before charging in to aid in the fight. Though the Imperial resistance was stubborn, he and the clones he'd found managed to plunge deep into the gap they'd created. Cut off, but with a clear shot to their mission objective, the clone troopers of the Republic grimly pressed on. They had been three quarters of the way to their destination when Sando and his men got word of other squads breaking through. The Imperials appeared to be withdrawing bit by bit. Though the other clones rallied at the thought of being the first at the scene, not the only ones, Sando kept his optimism in check. The imps were rabid, every last one, and he shuddered to think what could actually be happening to force such forces into a withdrawal. He began to feel as he had when he'd awoken to find his squad missing or dead, and his chances of survival essentially foregone. And that, Sando knew, was not a good thing. Yet they reached the position without further conflict, locating the precise place on the wall where they were to set their charges. Sando had the men spread out and form a small perimeter, while the demo specialists had their fun with the shaped charges. The clone had advised them to lay it on thick. He hoped they could take out the imp hardpoint just by the force of their entry, if possible. The best case scenario would be for them to be able to create their own exit through their former position, and the worst would be to get caught between that hard point's back and a dedicated assault from the imps still in the building. It was at this time that Sando and the others learned that the roof access teams were almost in position and that their reinforcements were only minutes away. The clone almost dared to relax, and then it started happening. At first, it wasn't obvious, but when 10 minutes rolled by and no sign of their reinforcements had arrived, the clones began checking in, just to be safe. Gone. Half the squads were just gone. Everyone was ordered to check in and for only short intervals to be taken in between, but this only highlighted the dread-inducing speed of the phenomenon as clones continued to vanish. Sando's platoon, or what was left of it, acted quickly, moving to seal off as many of the incoming access points as they could, closing them and rigging them with traps as quickly as they could manage. All the while, small hints and haunting pieces of the puzzle began to emerge over the radios. The sounds of thundering weapons could be heard, drawing nearer and nearer, and the incomplete screams and war cries of the assailed began to bleat out from their open comms. The clones managed to lock down a great deal of the surrounding rooms, powering doors with spare energy cells and barricading what was left, until they managed to narrow down the most likely approach to a single short hallway. Sando and half the men were tasked with holding it until the explosives were all set and lit. And in that darkness, beside his brothers, he waited. But despite how much time seemed to drag as he listened to their soft, shuffling and nervous breaths. Even he realized that they were not left waiting for long. Thunk, thunk, thunk. The unmistakable sound of hard metal footfalls began to fill the space. The acrid smell of weapons fire slowly gave way to the heady scent of alien incense. Sando could see it the thin lines and trails of smoke 
growing thicker and thicker from the shadows where he crept. Thunk, thunk, thunk. He swallowed hard, feeling his heart pounding painfully in his chest. He could feel the vibrations in the ground just ever so slightly as the specter of death approached. This is time, Sando. I told you I'd have you this time. Whispered the wet lips of death. Bitter sweat slicked the inside of his bodysuit, and he gripped the Imperial Deathlight more tightly. He knelt behind a set of overturned desks, weapon braced and sighted down the long hallway. Thunk. Thunk. And then a pause. The clones froze, held their breaths, and waited. But as before... They did not have to wait long before the angels descended upon them, and Sando was tested against an untestable foe. Obi-Wan ran his tongue over his top lip, tasting sweat, blinking it out of his eyes as he slowly circled the Imperial warrior before him. The man was monstrous in his powered armor, and though the manifestation of might he had begun the battle with had faded to nothing, the evident strength he still retained lent weight to the shadowed grin he bore. The Jedi Master could feel his heart beating heavily in his chest. Heavily, but not rapidly. The fight had gone on and on, so he had discarded the luxury of panic and the indulgence of uncertainty. Just doing what he had done already had required all of his focus. Required that he embrace Soresu in its entirety. Even that had barely been enough. Now he stood, a lone knight against a monster, and he would not fear. The inhuman warrior seemed to warp forward. No muscles, no joints moving or even twitching in the sudden lunge, looming wide and tall before Obi-Wan. The sudden transportation was almost enough to shock the Jedi to weakness, a thing which would have proven lethal as the Space Rain swung down his stave in a straight, thundering strike. The Jedi Master had discarded all expectations, however, merely accepting all new things as they occurred, his animal mind shrieking within the containment of his enforced tranquility. He caught the weapon on his, letting it slide down to one side in a silken parry, leaping forward with the same movement. His lightsaber followed the stave, pinning it below Obi-Wan as he propelled himself towards the Marine's face and kicked aiming for the monster's nose. The master's eyes grew wide then, as he watched shock spilling into his demeanor despite himself, his heel landing not upon the Astartes' smirking face, but in the man's waiting palm. He had released the stave with one hand as he swung, the swing itself being no more than a trick, a feint, a feint leading to this moment. The Marine gripped the heel in his left hand, squeezing, crushing, and sighed in soft disappointment as his fingers crumpled the boot utterly flat. Obi-Wan reeled back, having slid his foot out of the boot in the last second before it was crushed, his freed foot feeling cool as the air of the orrery made contact with his slick sock. The Jedi backed off, a single sweat-laden footprint trail following him as he did. I am not the first user of Soresu that you've encountered, Obi-Wan concluded. No, you are not, the Marine agreed. At least I assume you are not. I do not know this style of fighting by a name. But your Luminara was quite proficient in it. It is, in fact, the reason that she was the last one left alive. 
It is an enduring method of fighting, but it cannot conquer me. Soon I'll have you, just as I had her, with very similar results in the end. The Astartes added a moment later, as the circling began anew. Maybe, said the Jedi Master. He leapt forward then, breaking with the convention of his style and thrusting with his saber, sucking in the force in a surge of speed and strength he could maintain for but an instant. The maneuver appeared eerily similar to the Space Marine's own initial attack, though they were each accomplished in entirely novel fashions unrelated to the other. Nonetheless, the attack had a similar effect, forcing the Space Marine to snap up a parry, savagely hooking the Jedi Saber with his staff and pulling him in. Obi-Wan was forced to choose between releasing his Saber or being dragged into the pull of the Marine, and the warrior's free driving fist, which was much as he had planned it. Allowing himself to be pulled forward, Obi-Wan drew the Saber he had found on the floor before the meeting with the Imperial Warrior. Its bright yellow blade flickered to life in a hand the Space Marine had thought free of weapons. And Safran suddenly found himself trapped by his own maneuver. The deceitful strike having tricked him into his own folly. Seeing only one way through, Safran's eyes blazed blue in his skull, pulsing and flaring like twin suns going nova. He bellowed a roar which shook the bones of those present. And instead of withdrawing the fist he had planned to use to cave in Kenobi's skull, he pushed even more power and energy into it and punched forward with all his might. As the Jedi lanced into the fist with his yellow saber, the Space Marine was suddenly sheathed in a radiating cloak of power and his fist, likewise overlaid by the field of energy, caught the saber and stopped it in place without being pierced. Whirlwinds burst from the contact as the skill of the Jedi and the will of the Kyber Crystal collided with the direct touch of the Librarian's mind. Light flared in expanding bursts, and it was all Safran could do to keep his feet under him as he pushed against the saber's will to destroy his limb. Blood trickled in small streams from his nose, but he had broken Eldari Farseers on the breadth of his will before. And compared to that mind war, this was as nothing. Those were the thoughts he held close as he roared once more with breath he did not have. His voice a demonic quake of unsound. The saber which screeched and bit against his fist seemed to bend and separate into four struggling streams of power. The yellow light suddenly flushing deep, unbidden crimson before the hilt burst in the Jedi's hand. The Space Marine grinned in savage triumph, the expression meeting his face mere milliseconds before Kenobi's now sock-sheathed heel met his nose. Crunch! Safran spun away as Kenobi kicked off, coming down a short distance to the Space Marine's right, landing in a small clatter of armor and rising as he discarded the half-molten saber from his smoking burnt hand. The Jedi pushed the pain of his singed limb aside, flooding it with the force to ensure that it would continue to serve him. The Space Marine turned to face him, nose crooked, a wide, toothy grin stretched across his face. Amidst an order of witchling waifs, I am finding you to be a uniquely delightful challenge. It gratifies me that it is a human who ultimately stands before me and brings me some measure of power. The Imperial said, leaning his stave against his shoulder as he reached up carefully with his gauntleted hands. Obi-Wan cringed visibly as the Space Marine straightened his own nose, snorting out globs of blood afterwards in an utterly casual fashion. The Jedi Master reset his stance and spoke once more. I can see you are tiring, Space Marine. You are indeed built for war 
And between the first group you encountered and my stand here, you've gotten one. But will you win it? The Jedi shook his head as if to answer for the Astartes. Trust me, I have defeated weapons like you before, and I'll do so again as many times as I need to. The Astartes raised his eyebrow at that, a gesture Kenobi was only able to infer from the movement of his cheeks. The upper half of his face now wreathed in shadow, his eyes dimming once more, though the blue light there never vanished. You've defeated Space Marines in the past? He asked. Not as such, no, but I've defeated men made for war. Men who embraced both foul sorcery and technology to become killers. Men made by dark masters to be insurmountable in the field of battle. And I've bested each one, and I best them every time, said the Jedi. The Space Marine did not respond right away, watching with his unsettling, smoldering eyes as they circled one another. Obi-Wan was not rushing, taking his time to look for openings, seek his chance. I can sense that you are not lying, at least not from your point of view. The Space Marine rumbled at length. So I shall not lie either. Yes, I am somewhat worn down by all the fighting that has come before now. But Jedi, you do not yet understand the kind of war I was created to fight. For you, fighting for minutes, hours, even days at a time are skills to be remarked, to be honed. To you, and to most of your order, today has brought you to the pinnacle of your strength and perhaps beyond it. Am I wrong? The Jedi said nothing, which the Imperial clearly figured told him everything. The Psyker paused and shook his head before looking up at the Jedi Master with an expression which very nearly bordered on pity. To me, Jedi, this war is just another xenocide. Not only is all you see before you the definition of routine, but if I had to point out an aspect of this conflict that makes it notable, I would be forced to concede that the only novelty I've felt in this fight before now is how pathetically unprepared the Republic was for a true determined enemy. Obi-Wan grit his teeth, apprehension flooding his gut and turning to fury before he seized it. This man was boasting, but that did not mean he was lying as well. Indeed, from everything Obi-Wan could sense, he wasn't doing any such thing. He was barely even barbing his sentiment. You boast well enough. I'll give you that much, said the Jedi. But talking big is not the same as making good on it, and there is nothing you can say that will make me abandon my democracy, or my order." The Astartes' broad smile returned at that, evidently pleased with Kenobi's defiance. Good. Then I shall face you fully. He said, leaving Obi-Wan in silence. The Space Marine's grin only grew deeper at that, and he stopped circling, stepping forward instead. Do not mistake me, heretic. You are skilled enough to hold my focus, so let me be clear and honest as I hold theirs. Let those Jedi around us who may yet live to flee carry with them this knowledge. I am now going to crush you, break you, and bend you to the will of the Emperor. Those here will go with the full knowledge that you came against me with every strength you could muster. <laughs> 
Master. And if they are allowed to flee, they will do so burdened with the undeniable proof that it was all not nearly enough. Are you seriously still searching for it? I thought you were supposed to be good at this. Whined one of the nearby clones. Echo had no idea who, he was too busy, focusing too much to pay any attention to their banter. The cyborg was sitting in what remained of Admiral Trench's command chair, a thick cable linking his access probe to the chair's systems. Though he was seated and his body seemed relaxed, his face did not reflect that. Brows furrowed, sweat creasing the wrinkles on his head, it was clear he was not having an easy time of it. I am good at this. A droid wouldn't last five seconds inside code this badly ruptured. Sorting through all of this is like stuffing a Wookiee or a Zabrak and a Deveroni into a blender and trying to sort the teeth from the horns, he said through clenched teeth. Excuses, the clone jibed half-heartedly. A few chuckled nervously as well, but none did so earnestly, not even the clone who had spoken the joke. They were all tense and coping, all fully aware of what had happened with the commander, and that even after recovering her, Ahsoka's condition had remained critical. They knew she would likely pull through, that Bacta combined with her well-worn grit would carry her over any hurdle these injuries could pose. They knew that, but still, they all worried even Echo. But he shoved it all aside. Somewhere, lost in all this ruptured data and raided systems, was the system control for the bomb on an axis. He knew they couldn't hold the ship, not indefinitely. And already he had been forced to detour from his search in order to close bulkheads and seal off the captured Separatist vessel from the Imperial vessel which was adhered to it. Ray shields and Durasteel. But for how long could those barriers hold against the dedicated breaching attempt? Echo pushed that thought out of the way as well. All that mattered in the end was finding the controls for the bomb. That was all. So it was that even as the doors into the bridge opened, Echo continued to work. That even as the newcomer strode in behind him, drawing the attention of all other clones, he did not notice. How's the search coming, Echo? Asked Ahsoka. The clone jerked, blinking, only half able to see through his own true eyes sunken into the system as he was. Still, it was enough sight that he could see her when he turned to look to his right. She was alive, though certainly not unscathed. One of her arms was bound in a sling, and though she had received back to treatments, her limp suggested that she would benefit from a cast as well. Scorch marks marred the skin around her face, and her montrals were slightly discolored, bruised. Still, it was good to see her, and he gave her a brief grin before returning his focus. Not as well as your recovery, Commander. Imps completely scrambled this system, tore it apart searching for usable intel. I'm having trouble navigating anything in here, he said. Ahsoka sighed. A gentle gust of air passed the lips lightly caked in her own blood. And she shook her head. I thought as much. You can stop searching, Echo. I don't think we are going to find it. It probably isn't even on an axis anymore, she said. What? Why? The clone asked. Because I spoke with that captive priest before he escaped. And he told me a lot about these people. And how they think more than he probably intended. These tech priests, they would be more interested in how our bomb works than in adding it to their arsenal. It honestly might be more permissible in their religion to take our technology apart than to actually use it, the former Jedi said. Are you sure about that, Commander? It's not every day you come across a planet cracker. Ahsoka laughed at that and the sound chilled Echo down to his bones. Maybe not for us she said, and left it at that. Echo nodded and began to withdraw himself from the system. It was then that he noticed something wrong. 
It was not obvious, not at first, but when he finally caught the change, it sent his cyberized mind into a frenzy. Commander, the imps aren't trying to get in anymore, Echo said, straining to control his voice. Ahsoka raised an eyebrow at that, not quite grasping what he meant, though Echo was already taking action. He began clearing the airlocks, severing the umbilicals that the Imperials had connected all over the ship. They aren't trying to get in? Asked the former Jedi. What do you mean? Echo grimaced, sweat sliding from his slightly gray skin and running over the rigid steel of his cybernetics. Ahsoka, I mean that the imps aren't banging on the airlocks or trying to cut their way in. In fact, I think that they've largely retreated from the ship. They aren't trying to make holdouts, he said. So what does that mean? Ahsoka asked, clearly alarmed, though the origin of her tension came more from Echo's tone than from his actual words. It means... Echo said, struggling with the final ties that bound the two vessels together. That they don't want the ship anymore! He almost yelled. His words proved prophecy. For the next few moments, warning alarms and sirens began to flicker and blare across the bridge. The ship rocked suddenly, and the sound of metal screeching could be heard by everyone aboard. What's happening right now, Echo? Ahsoka yelled as she braced herself against the nearby console with her good hand. Weapons locks! The Imperial ship is targeting us with its broadside mounted weapons! Echo called back. Ahsoka paled ever so slightly. Get us out of here, Echo! She ordered. Already on it! He called back. The ship screeched again, and the rocking that came with the sound was almost enough to shake Ahsoka to the floor. As many clones were. I can't promise we'll take all the ship with us, though! He added a moment later. Ahsoka nodded and tapped her comm piece. Rex, rally the 501st and bring everyone to the bridge, prisoners included! She ordered. Aye, Commander! He called back over the earpiece. No sooner had the response been received than another quake shook the ship causing the lights to flicker all across the bridge. Got it! We're loose! Echo called. Deploy the countermeasures! Ahsoka ordered as she hung on to the console. Roger! Echo called back. He did what he could, activating the sporadic systems of the ship's defenses as the engines, or what was left of them, burned at full. The effort was just enough to avoid the cascading row of cannons that had faced them but was not quite enough to avoid the shoulder-mounted laser battery that the Imperial warship had prepared. The beam struck the rear of the ship, mangling the pathetic veil of shields that Echo had managed to erect before impact. Engines are gone! Echo yelled. How much? Ahsoka called back. Everything! He said. Ahsoka grit her teeth and looked out through the massive transparent canopy of the bridge. Axum hung outside like a false promise, never to be reached. But Echo saw something different. He triggered the maneuvering thrusters and began rolling the ship on its side, angling towards the planet. Ahsoka saw the disorienting tilt begin and looked over at the clone, confusion clearly writ on her face. Echo, what are you... she began. They might fire at their own forces and they will definitely fire at us, the clone began to say. But they won't fire on the temple if I can bring us down that way with just maneuvering thrusters? Ahsoka asked. We are trapped, Commander. No way out, but it's not my first time. In moments like these, the only way I've ever made it through is by asking myself a very specific question, he said, sinking more and more of himself into the wounded ship. His vision blurred and vanished. His skin became steel, brushed against the void and hateful heat of lethal wounds. His eyes became sensors, half-functioning as the light atmosphere around them began to heat. His limbs became the burning maneuvering thrusters, clawing at space to escape the sights of the enemy weapons. And what question is that? asked Ahsoka. What would General Skywalker do? And if General Skywalker was trapped on a half-dying Providence class while stuck in the middle of an active battle, I know exactly what he would do, the clone said, a fierceness entering his voice which made it clear to the Turgutan commander that the clone fully expected to die in the attempt of this. She said nothing against it, for there was no other way she could see. Instead, she tightened her grip and asked, So what do you think Anakin would do? 
Echo allowed the insanity of the moment of his life to overwhelm his countenance. Half clone, half droid, half dying ship. He clenched his teeth in a manic grin as he answered, eyes wide and seeing nothing. He'd land it. He'd land it right on top of their fracking heads.